are you around somewhere? There you are. You get the honors. You get to bring us home. How's that feel? <laughs> so good. I wasn't. <laughs> that feels really good. <laughs> All right. I thought you were speechless. I thought you might have uh, gotten your breath taken away because you heard out about that. So it's great to see you again. I know you've got an incredible talk for us and I am very excited for it. And I will also mention that you are helping organize the Toronto local meetup chapter. So if anyone is in Toronto and wants to hang out with more like-minded people that are doing this kind of stuff with LLMs and machine learning, hit up Apoorva and go to one of the local meetups. Okay. Um, since we have very little time, I'm just going to get started. Um, uh, I'm going to speak about current state of LLMs in production. Uh, my name is Apoorva Misra, um, and I'm a senior machine learning engineer working at Truckstop, and I have a background in natural language processing. And like Demetrius said, I'm based in Toronto. Reach out to me if you want to be a part uh, of the MLOps community meetup here. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, LLM models in production. And because it's hard, I asked DALI to generate images with the text hard, which was really hard for DALI to, to do. Uh, so um, let's get started. Um, what I've been seeing um, with different companies is generally uh, RACs are the ones which go into production. They seem like a simpler um, system to put into production, at least initially when you look at them. Um, since we already have like had like a couple of... Um, um, presentations about racks. I'm just going to go over this very quickly. So what you have is your, you have your data set. Um, it can be any data source. It can be Confluence documentation. It could be YouTube video transcripts. It could be any sort of help articles. And what you do is you chunk them, like break them into pieces because uh, generally like embedding LLM models have a limit to the context length. So you, you would want to chunk them and embed them um, using the embedding LLM and then store them somewhere. Um, that's where vector DBs come in. And then when a user comes and asks a question, what you want to do is go look for similar chunks, which would be helpful in answering that query. Um, pull that in and send it to the LLM along with the query so that it generates a natural language answer. So this is the gist of RACS. Um, and what I've seen is generally it's this RAG model, a uh, uh, RAG system which goes into production, or it's um, RAG is acting as a component of a larger system. You, so you're using semantic kernel to build a bigger application, which could uh, answer a lot of user queries. Um, and then when, when the user comes and asks about help articles, what it does is it figures out, oh, this is the plugin uh, that I should be using, which is a RAC system. So it'll call the RAC system. If, if the user is asking about something else, it would call the API to answer that question or maybe call the search engine to answer that question. So um, so it's it, it might just be a whole system by itself or it's a component of a larger system. Um, so I'm just going to go over um, the RAC system, break it into pieces and see how um, each, each of those pieces need a lot more detail in there. For example, uh, to start with, uh, you have the extraction module. That is, you have your source data somewhere and then you would have to break it into pieces, like I mentioned, because LLMs have a, L embedding LLMs have a context length. Um, and then you would want to embed them. So um, for the chunking, either, um, you would have you would have to decide like what the chunk size should be um, and how many number of chunks you would want to break down the documentation. Into. For example, if you have PDF documentation, you can just chunk each page at a time or like multiple pages at the same time. And this would completely depend on your use case. For example, um, I've seen in some cases in which they break it down into smaller chunks and when they're pulling like similar chunks, uh, what they do is along with the one which matched the similarity, they pull the chunks around it as well. Um, or uh, other times what I've seen is they generate multiple embeddings of the document. For example, they generate the embedding of this page. Along with that, they summarize the page, generate a summary, and then embed the summary as well. Um, and sometimes, uh, depending on the industry, you would have term terminologies uh, which, um, which the LLM model doesn't know about. So you would have to take that into account as well. Um, so the next step would be the embedding. So after you have done the chunking, you would embed the uh, chunks. So you would have to choose which embedding model. Again, this would depend on your use case. And then you have the Hugging Face Leadership Board that you can choose the embedding model from. But what I've seen is it, it does, it, the, the top most uh, embedding model might not give you the best um, results. So it would depend on the use case. So you would have to test out multiple embedding models and see which one works the best for your use case. Um, 
And then once you've done the embedding, you have to store it somewhere. So that's where the vector databases come in. Uh, you can use something as simple as Postgres with PG vector. I've used it, it works really well. Um, but then these vector databases, they are customized for this use case and they have a lot more functionality in there um, to help with that. And for choosing the vector database, there are a number of factors you have to take into account, like on-prem versus cloud, the indexing speed versus uh, query latency, like how long it takes for it to like, uh, go save it in the vector database and like pull it when you have a query. Um, and then like good recall versus low latency, sparse, dense vectors. Hybrid search would be keyword search plus semantic similarity. Um, that's again like something that vector databases provide. Um, and then uh, you want it in memory on disk, depending on like which algorithm it uses, uh, it, either of them can be faster. And then uh, does it do pre-filtering or post-filtering? After getting the results, does it like do re-ranking, um, which might be necessary as well, depending on your use case. Um, and again, like uh, the, uh, the icons that I've put, the logos I've put, it's not exhaustive. There are more vector databases out there. So that's uh, something, of, this is again a rabbit hole that you can go deep, uh, take a deep dive in. Um, okay, so after you have saved your embeddings in the vector database, when a query comes in, you have to retrieve um, the relevant chunks which would be useful uh, in answering that query. Um, so um, for retrieving that, there can be different criteria you can take into account. One is like semantic matching that we were talking about. You would want to find similar um, text uh, and which would be able to answer the question. So if you look at the picture underneath, the image underneath, um, it's the distance metrics that uh, Postgres provides, Postgres with PG Vector, like cosine distance inner product. There are, these are like uh, uh, provided by PG Vector. And then uh, the image on the top is the re-ranking. So after doing uh, semantic similarity and finding the uh, relevant uh, chunks, it, the top k chunks relevant to answer your question. You would, you might want to re-rank it to figure out which is more relevant. So Cohere provides um, an API through which you can uh, do re-ranking after you have pulled out the chunks from the um, database. And then uh, you might want to do, like I mentioned uh, in the previous slide, hybrid matching. That is, you might want to use keyword matching along with semantic similarity, because again, like different industries have key terms which. Um, uh, the embedding model is not trained on. Um, the other thing can be you want to do deterministic plus fuzzy matching. You want to do some uh, semantic similarity, but you want to look for documents only from January to March of 2023. So a combination of that to get you the results. Um, and then after you have built your system, you have to figure out like if it's working properly, is it worth putting it into production? That's where evaluation comes in. Uh, and like Effie was mentioning, like you have component level evaluation and you have end-to-end -end system evaluation. So for component level, uh, especially uh, for the rack systems, you have the source, um, source where uh, all the data is. Then you have the context, which it pulls uh, from the vector DB to, uh, relevant to answering the query. And then uh, you have the query and you have the answer. So um, you can break down the system into retrieval. How is the retrieval uh, functioning? So um, given a query, does it retrieve relevant context from the vector DB to answer that query? The other thing uh, you can uh, measure it on is answering quality. Given the correct context and a query, is the answer generated um, of the quality that you expect it to be. Generally, what I've seen is um, um, companies using LLMs to score um, the rack system, and they would ask you to like score between one to five. And then again, like Demetrius had asked this question before in a presentation, like there is bias, like GPT-4 would say GPT-4 answers are the best or GPT-3.5 answers are the best. So you have to keep that into account as well when you're evaluating using LLMs. Um, okay. Okay, after you have done the evaluation, what you want at the end of the day is a system which is performant and um, it's cost efficient, right? So it needs to like perform at the best quality and it should not cost you a lot. Um, LLMs get expensive as you scale, um, but I have seen, um, this is uh, an image from notdiamond.ai. It lets you route your queries to different LLMs based on the complexity. So a more complex query um, might be answerable by GPT-4, but a simpler query maybe can be answered by Llama, which might be cheaper. So it lets you do the routing. Um, and um, you can do this yourself as well using logistic regression with count vectorizer, like be, build your own classification system when the query comes in, it roots it to the right LLM to answer the query. The other thing is caching, um, so that you are doing less LLM hits 
when you're answering um, the query. Okay, um, just this is the last slide. I just wanted to go over um, my experience building LLM systems. Um, recently, like I'm working with software engineers, and what I've noticed is it's really hard for them to get a grasp of um, how different it is to build with LLM systems. Like the code flow is very different. It's like a black box and there's lots happening and it's very different to keep track of what's happening when it's calling which plugin and how dependent it is on the prompt. Like sometimes changing the code doesn't affect the result, but like changing the prompt does. Um, and then testing is also very different. It's not deterministic. You cannot say you solve the problem. Um, all the time and sometimes what really happens is you change the prompt or you change something in the code and you have fixed this problem but you might have like um made something perform worse so it might degrade the system overall and then again like token limits so there are like different factors um which uh, uh, which are very different from traditional software engineering engineering so it's like it's really important to keep communicating and collaborating really well when you're working with software engineers um that's that's all from my end. Oh my god, I love it. Porfa, that is awesome because I could tell you were trying to cram in as much information as possible in those last moments. It, it was incredible. Thank you so much for this talk. How was it for you? <laughs> Did you get everything in that you wanted to say? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Almost. <laughs> well, awesome. Well, I think that is it, folks. Apoorva, huge thank you for anyone that has questions for Apoorva.